So when we were learning about electric fields, we saw Gauss's law, which told us about the electric flux through a closed surface and that it was equal to the charge enclosed within the surface divided by epsilon naught. So we could write this as phi E is equal to the integral around a closed surface of E dot dA, which is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now, because magnetic fields can also be modeled with field lines, we can also calculate a magnetic flux for magnetic fields. And so the equation for magnetic flux is phi B is equal to the integral of B dot dA, where dA in this case has the same meaning as in the electric field case. The magnitude of dA is equal to the surface area of a little increment that we're considering, and the direction is perpendicular to that surface. Now, with magnetic flux, we can also picture this as the number of field lines that are cutting through a surface, just as in the electric field case. Magnetic flux actually has its own units, known as the Weber, which are written as a capital W and then a B. These units are named after the German physicist Wilhelm Weber, who invented the electromagnetic telegraph along with Carl Friedrich Gauss, whose name should also be familiar to you. Now, in the electric field case, we saw that in order to have a non-zero flux through a surface, we had to place charge within the surface. And by placing charge through the surface, we had electric field lines that started or ended within that surface. Now, in the magnetic field case, we can't have magnetic field lines that start or end somewhere because we can't have a north pole by itself or a south pole by itself. Instead, magnetic field lines always form loops. So however we imagine placing a surface near a magnetic field, it's impossible to have a different number of magnetic field lines entering and leaving the surface. So this actually leads us to Gauss's law for magnetism, which tells us that the integral over a closed surface of B dot dA is equal to zero. Now, initially, this may appear not especially useful as it's just zero, who cares? But what this allows us to do is to replace more complex surfaces with simpler ones, which can help us calculate the flux through these complex surfaces. So let's have an example of a problem where we use that technique now. So the problem is, a hemispherical surface of radius r is placed in the magnetic field of strength b so that the plane tangential to the top of the hemisphere is perpendicular to b as shown. What is the magnetic flux through this surface? Okay, so you can see in the diagram here, it's only drawn on a plane, but this is a three-dimensional hemispherical surface, and we've got our magnetic field lines going up. Now, in order to work out what the flux through this surface is, it helps us to put a bottom onto our hemisphere. So if we put a circle across the bottom of our hemisphere, which I've sketched in red here, so the area of that circle is equal to pi r squared, it's a flat cir circle here, then we've now got a closed surface. And we know that the magnetic flux through the closed surface has to be equal to zero. And this helps us because it's fairly easy to calculate the magnetic flux through this red circle that we've added on now. So if we draw A for the circle, it's in the direction down like this because it always comes out of a closed surface. So we can say, well, the flux through that surface is going to be B times dA. B is going up while dA is coming down. So these are anti-parallel, if you like. They're, they're parallel, but in opposite directions. So when we substitute in for these, we can pull the magnetic field out the front because we've got a constant magnetic field here, but we'll end up with a negative sign because B and dA are in opposite directions. So we can write this as minus B dA as the flux through just this circle here. But we know what we get when we integrate over dA because we know what the area of our circle is. So this is equal to minus b times pi r squared. 
So we now know the magnetic flux through the circular bottom to this hemisphere. And we know that the total flux through the bottom and the hemisphere is equal to zero. So this tells us that the flux through the circular bottom plus the flux through the hemisphere must give us zero. So the flux through the hemisphere is going to be zero, the total flux, minus the flux through the circle, which is equal to b pi r squared. So that was much easier than calculating the flux through that hemisphere directly.